on behalf of Sister Marjorie Hinckley and her daughter, Sister Kathleen Barnes, Sister Ruth Faust and her daughter, Jana Coombs, and my mother, Sister Frances Monson, we welcome you this day. My name is Ann Dibb, and I've been asked to serve as moderator for this women's conference presentation. This week has probably been a busy one for each one of us, and yet I seriously doubt that our week has been as busy as that of Sister Hinckley's and Sister Faust's. For just last week, President Hinckley on Friday, President Hinckley and President Faust, accompanied by their wives, traveled to Bogota, Colombia, where President Hinckley dedicated another temple to the Lord. After the dedication, Sister Hinckley and President Hinckley traveled on to Santiago, Chile, where they met with saints there. Then they returned to Bogota, and after the final sessions of the dedication, traveled with the Fouse back home to Salt Lake. I'd say this has been a pretty busy week for them. And so we're so thankful for the sisters of the First Presidency, their wives, that they are here with us this, here with us this day. And we thank you for coming and acknowledge the preparations that you have made to be here this day. I know that many of you make this a great outing. You come with your mothers, your grandmothers, your daughters, your sisters, your friends. And then there are those of you who choose to come all by yourselves, hoping that your spirit will be touched and your testimonies strengthened, enabling you to carry on in your great responsibilities. We thank you for coming this day. The title of our presentation is Strength and Wisdom Through Experience. I remember when we first received this ass assignment, I was talking with my mother and she jokingly replied, I'd better get some strength and wisdom for all of my experience. <laughs> <laughs> Yet sometimes as we live through a particularly difficult time, we might ask if it were possible to forego the strength and wisdom that we might receive in the future and plead to our Heavenly Father to remove the burden from our lives in the present. But that is not the Lord's way. We need to be reminded of the Lord's plan. We must humble ourselves and pray most fervently that the Lord will surely keep His promise and he will lift us up and sustain us in our time of greatest need. For he is our Father, and we are his daughters, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is our sure salvation. We will now turn the time over to the Fausts, to the Monsons, and conclude with the Hinckleys. We look forward to hearing their remarks. Jan and I feel very appreciative to be here with you people today. We're so grateful for the <laughs> Isn't she wonderful? <laughs> Before we begin, I want to express my love, my appreciation to Sister Hinckley and Sister Monson. You can see Sister Hinckley, the wife of our prophet, is really an elect lady in all the words that it means, an elect lady. And I want to be just like her. <laughs> Than that. <laughs> Her little quip was, you can do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, I've watched Sister Monson. She has a quiet dignity about her, and she is a woman of great integrity. I consider myself very fortunate 
to be associated with them, let alone very blessed to be their friend. I want to ask Janet to interview me. <laughs> I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> I think just to make Mother more comfortable, so I'm willing to do this. They've asked us to come today, Mother, and to to share some of the experiences of your life where you have gained strength and gained wisdom. And as you reflect back on your life, Mother, where would you say in what areas where you have found this? Well, I've looked back over my long life and <clears throat> my mother keeps coming to my mind. How grateful I am for a wonderful mother that was a living example of eternal values. And she taught them to us, not only through her everyday actions, but in words. One incident that stands out in my mind is the principle of obedience. When I was very young, my father was called to serve a mission. My mother at that time was the mother of seven children and she was pregnant with her eighth child. Now in those days, the wife did not go on the mission with the missionary as they do now. She was to stay home and take care of the family and our small little farm. There were 16 cows to milk twice a day, fences to be mended, hay to be bought. Now these were just some of the chores that went along with running the farm. The household chairs, the chores, included baking bread daily, tending the garden where we f harvested our food, and then we sold eggs and milk on the side to supplement our income. She carried on these responsibilities by herself, besides doing all that she could to support her husband on his mission. You share these stories with me and I marvel at her ability. Do you remember hearing Grandma Lily ever complain or be resentful of what she was expected to do? No. I don't think she knew she could complain because she never did. <laughs> because she never did. And I've, I've thought about that, but she she accepted these burdens, I would call burdens, as a calling from the Lord to sustain her husband. Now she was a single parent at that time, as you would identify her, nurturing and loving and caring for almost eight children. So how do you think Grandma Lily did this each day, day in and day out? Well, I wondered that myself. And I don't know how she did it except when I got a little older and I matured. I had a better understanding of where her strength came from. She was alone, yes. But yet, she wasn't alone. She had been taught all of her life in her family to rely on the Lord. And because she was obedient, she had the companion of her Heavenly Father. The Holy Ghost was her best friend. He was her mentor. He was her confidant and her teacher. Now, remembering these memories were the beginning of where I learned I would find my strength and my wisdom. I also learned that great 
great blessings come from obedience. I think grandmother was a great teacher because my childhood memories is full of memories of you doing whatever you could to sustain and support dad and whatever he was asked to do. You worked very hard, mother, to make sure there was a warm meal ready and we could sit down as a family for dinner before dad rushed in the door at six o'clock from work and rushed back out again at seven to go to the steak center, which in those days was nearly every weeknight. But more important than that, mother, what I remember was that you felt a responsibility for your own good works. You used to say to me, Jana, I can't get to heaven on your dad's coattails. <laughs> you were always conscious of what your Heavenly Father and your church leaders wanted you to do, and you were obedient to them and always wanted to do whatever was expected. I think I probably witnessed more hands-on experience about service and obedience and commitment from you, Mother, watching you because you were at home and we, we spent time together. And you were a great example. And I know that blessings came into our home because of your personal obedience, Mother. That feels good to hear. <laughs> now share with us another area, another quality through your life which you have relied on. Let me tell you about a wonderful chair. It's a wonderful green rocking chair. It was in the corner of our kitchen. And it, that was by the stove. And so that corner was always warm and cozy and friendly. This rocking chair meant a lot to me because when we got skinned knees and when we, our feelings were hurt and we had sorrow in our hearts, this is where we were made feel, to feel better. But the most important thing that happened at that rocking chair was the mother, what mother taught me about prayer. We each took our turn to kneel at mother's lap to say our prayers. Until we were old enough, we didn't need help and suggestions anymore. But it was very important for my mother to teach her children what had been so important to her in her life. Mother taught us that prayer was the armor to protect her children. I remember as a child in our home, Mother, that prayer was a part of everyday life. We had our morning prayers, we had our blessings on the food at mealtime. We had our evening prayers as a family, and we were encouraged to have personal prayers. In fact, I honestly felt that if I left the house without my prayers, I was leaving something behind. And in my mind's eye, I can, can see myself grabbing my stuff and hollering through the house that I was leaving and hearing your echo as constant as anything. Don't forget to say your prayers. That's what I remember is the prayers, having them and they were there. I don't remember it being a hassle to call everyone together or a burden or that it was an impossible task. I just remember that we had them and they were always there. So was it a hassle? <laughs> Maybe I'd be fibbing a little if I said no. <laughs> But just a little, because do you know what we did? We had sets of prayers. Whoever was leaving first, we'd have prayers with them. Whoever left next, we'd have prayers with them. And it seemed to work. And prayers were so important to me that I never hesitated to suggest if anyone had forgotten to call the family together to it's time for prayers will you share with the sisters mother 
maybe one of your most significant prayers and how you learned how powerful that was? I guess the, the prayer that I spoke or prayed for most longingly in my heart. You know, every person has a deep longing, a personal longing. And my greatest desire and dream then was to be a mother. And after my husband and I had been married for several years, and after much prayer, I was afraid that we weren't going to have any children. So I felt like the Lord wasn't really hearing my prayers or listening to my prayers. We'd pray, and then we'd pray, and then we'd fast, and then we'd pray some more. We went to doctors, we went to the temple. We kept praying and still no children. I was becoming frustrated. But finally, we sought a priesthood blessing. We had five children in 10 years. We now have 22 wonderful grandchildren. Some are here today. And four great grandchildren expecting our fifth in August. I'm so eternally grateful. I'm sensitive to the fact that the Lord doesn't always answer our prayers, the prayers that we have in our hearts. But I do have a testimony that he knows what's in our hearts. He loves us. I know that he is where we get our strength to go forward. He sustains us in our heartaches. And he gives us wisdom to solve our problems. <clears throat> I'm so grateful for my testimony. So grateful for our family that we received the answer to our prayers. And he ratified the priesthood blessing. I'm even more grateful than you are, Mother. <laughs> Before you close, Mother, I hope I won't embarrass you, but I, I do want to take a moment and, and say to these sisters that um, it, it has been my great blessing to be your daughter. And I can say unequivocally that I know of no other woman who I, who I know that is any more Christ-like than my mother. In fact, when I was a young girl and trying to think of what Jesus would want me to do as I was taught in primary and at home so that I would know how to choose between right and wrong, I didn't have as mature of a relationship of who my Heavenly Father was as I was young and it was just growing. So what I would do, Mother, is I would think about you. And I would, I would try to wonder if you would approve of that or what you think, or if you would think that that would be something I should do. And as I grew older and wiser and became to understand my Heavenly Father better, I realized that you too would react the very same way. You would not and could not ever do anything that would displease your Heavenly Father. And secondly, I want to pay tribute to you for being there. Women have an incredible avenue of influence 
ones I don't think we even comprehend. But by you being there, Mother, we were best friends as growing up. You were my best friend. You still are mine. <laughs> and I remember very many hours where it, I didn't mind working as long as we were working together and we'd stay up and make pies and we'd work in the yard and we'd do household chores and we'd take care of the little children <laughs> together. And I just appreciated you making me feel like my life was important, that you were concerned about me and who my friends were. You asked me what I thought, what my opinions were. And as I reflect back, your being there in my life has had the most profound influence of anyone. My children always say that grandmother is a saint. I'm going to share this with them. Grandma is a saint. And the only reason she hasn't been translated is because Grandpa needs her. <laughs> I didn't even pay her to say that either. <laughs> it's true. You can ask anyone in the family. Before we close, I want you to know we have a testimony of the gospel. We're so grateful to have a living prophet that has such a wonderful influence mm -hmm on the world today. And he's called of God as all the rest of them have been. I know that God lives, that Jesus is the Christ, our dear friend. I say this humbly in Jesus' name, amen. 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 It would be nearly impossible to relate our family's experiences without mentioning my father's callings. My dad was a bishop before I was born. I had my first day of school in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, where dad and mother were serving as, dad was the mission president there. And we had a young family <coughs> when dad was called to serve as an apostle. I was in fourth grade, I was nine years old. My older brother Tom was 12 years old, and my younger brother Clark was about four. And so Mother had a lot of responsibilities placed upon her. At that time, it was not unusual for Dad to travel for four to five weeks at a time as he would journey to Australia or other areas in the world, and he would interview all of the mission, missionaries and have so many experiences. And I must say, that we were blessed as a family because again mother was always home with us and then when dad came home he would share with us all the stories of where he had been and people that he had met and how he felt that the Lord had blessed and guided him in his efforts. I'll always remember one incident that kind of shows a little bit of humor in our family and my mother doesn't even remember this. But Dad was gone every weekend at various conferences, and she would always have a roast for us or a nice dinner. And my brother and I would bother each other and tease each other all the time. And one time, Mother had just had enough of it. And she said, I have had enough of you two bickering with one another. I think I'm going to take a little drive. And she left. <laughs> well, I looked at Tom and I thought, oh, we've done it now. And we waited for mom to get back. <laughs> Several hours went by and she finally came home. When I had the courage to ask her in the next couple of days, where did you go, mom? She just laughed and said, I thought I'd take a drive. I took a drive to Provo, and I felt much better when I got back. <laughs> but then I also remember going with Mom as we would pick up Dad at the airport, and again, he would share those experiences with us. Mom has always been a great support to my father in many varied ways. Again, that hot meal was always waiting for him, no matter what time he was returning from the office. She's a sounding board as my father relates his experiences and his ideas, 
and she shares her opinions with him, and she's always a companion to him, and that's a wonderful thing for me to witness. A memory that I have of mom and dad, which is ongoing, but has been happening for many, many years, is in the evenings, dad will say, Fran, some cheese and crackers would be nice. And so she'll go upstairs and get the cheese and crackers and a big glass of milk, and he'll snack away on the, on the cheese and crackers while he goes through all the papers in his briefcase, watching television, sharing stories, all of those things happening at the same time, and mom sitting there right by his side or ironing his handkerchiefs or his shirts. But again, mother is always present. And it's wonderful for me to be with my mother this day. I always love to be with my mom. I'm thankful for the friendship that we share. I think part of this is because dad was always gone. <laughs> and I became her friend in a very sweet manner. She's a wonderful wife, a wonderful mother, and a wonderful grandmother, and I'm so thankful for her, and I love her so dearly. Now, why don't we begin? <laughs> Mom, maybe you could share the unusual common connection that you and Dad shared before you even knew each other, and then tell how you met and married. Well, I'd like to say thank you very much, Anne, because she has been not only my daughter, but my closest friend, and I've always been so grateful to have had at least one daughter, and, uh, and we love her very much and, and uh, her family. I also have enjoyed the association with Sister Faust and Sister Hinckley. They've been fantastic. I just wish I could just be a little bit as wonderful as they are, because I, I have grown very close to them, and I appreciate all that they have done for me. Uh, you mentioned about our meeting, our dating. Uh, I met my husband at uh, the University of Utah while we were students up there, and uh, he saw me at a dance apparently and, and decided he wanted to meet me, which Eventually he did, as I was waiting for the streetcar down on the corner of 13th East to uh, go to work, and he came and introduced himself, and uh, we rode downtown together on the trolley, that wonderful old trolley which has so many, many memories from, uh, of Salt Lake from uh, years ago. Uh, he called me up a couple days later, and. Uh, invited me on a date. We went to a steak dance down in the Pioneer Steak. He was in that steak at that time. And as he came to my home to pick me up, my mother and father were there waiting to meet him. And uh, <clears throat> when he said that his name you know, was Monson, Tom Monson, uh, my father said, now that's Swedish, isn't it? And, uh, my husband said, well, yes, it is. He said, my grandfather was uh, born in Sweden. And um, my father went into his uh, dresser drawer and took out a photograph of uh, two missionaries. <clears throat> and he brought this out and he asked uh, my husband, now, do you know this Elder Monson? And he said, well, yes, he was my... Uh, uh, grandfather and my my uh, father was just thrilled he thought oh we knew him he was a missionary in our home in Sweden and helped convert my mother and father and 12 children by that time he was in so <laughs> and my my mother was so thrilled to hear this because my mother also was born uh, in Sweden. So, uh, of course, we, uh, we dated for a while and uh, eventually got married, of course, and uh, 
shortly after we were married, just about two years, I think, I'm going into another mm -hmm. subject perhaps, uh, my husband was called as the bishop of the uh, sixth, seventh ward, which was uh, two of the original wards that were built uh, at the beginning of uh, the church in Salt Lake City. And uh, it was a large ward. Now wards are smaller. But at that time, uh, I think he said that there was 1,080 members in our ward and uh, 85 widows and uh, many, many, the people were poor in those days. Many were on welfare, church welfare, many on uh, uh, county welfare, and it was a real challenge, but uh, when I, he was only 22 when he was called. And he, he just sort of literally took the bull by the horns and, and went in, and the, the attendance wasn't very good in the sacrament meeting at that time because, well, the people didn't have cars, and they were, uh, it was an older area, and so it was difficult for them to even get up to the uh, ward, but uh, he worked at it and advertised all the meetings and did everything he could until it was just a fantastic uh, ward or organization uh, by the time that uh, that he got through, so we had we had many many experiences in that old ward. The people were wonderful, and and I think of the Relief Society presence that he had to uh, help him write the orders, welfare orders for food uh, every every single week because I there must have been uh, about 60 welfare cases. And he would always try, if uh, they couldn't get certain things at the warehouse, why, he would give them a little extra money so they could buy a few of the extra things. Nowadays, I think Welfare Square has everything, but in those days, they didn't. And so that was a wonderful experience to associate with, with these uh, wonderful people. Both you and Dad had remarkable patriarchal blessings giving, given by such spiritual and great patriarchs. Dad received his blessing as a young Aaronic priesthood holder, and Mom, you received yours after you were married. They complement each other so beautifully. Tell us about your mission call and your mission to Canada. We truly, we feel, have the most beautiful patriarchal blessings. I read them over again the other the other morning and and thought the, our patriarchs really were in tune with the Lord because uh, he told us the most wonderful things and uh, I know when uh, the patriarch was it was different we had different part, patriarchs uh, giving me my blessing uh, I had these problems questions uh, running through my mind, you know, about uh, what I should do and, and these various things. And, and that patriarch, as I was thinking about these questions and problems I had, he answered them while his hands were upon my head. And I thought, my goodness, this is, this is something I was so impressed. And uh, he said, this patriarch of blessing is given to you under the influence of our Heavenly Father, and he said, you could feel the Spirit of the Lord here because he is answering your prayers, and he did. And uh, I thought that was so beautiful. And in my husband's patriarchal blessing, I could say they tie in beautifully. And uh, he had his blessing, I think, when he was about 15. Uh, I was a little bit older. But um, in it, the uh, patriarch said that you will go out into the world to preach the gospel in a way that people will understand your message and come into the faith. And uh, I asked my husband, 
uh, that night that we were, or day that we were reading these, and I said, do you know, I wonder when that will be, because he didn't go on a mission as uh, a youth, as an elder, because it was during the war, and missionaries weren't being sent out. So uh, he went in the Navy and, and uh, went to school, and so he didn't go on a mission at that time. And uh, I just kept wondering, so when will this be? You know, it says that you're going to go out in the mission field. And here we have two children, and, and uh, I just couldn't figure it out. But after, just a few days later, President uh, Richards called my husband in and uh, called him to be mission president in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And I thought, that, that's the answer. And uh, I hadn't understood it before, but, but it truly was. And uh, we had a wonderful experience there to work with the missionaries and, and uh, 400 missionaries in a huge area of Toronto on, and Ontario and uh, Quebec, Ontario and Quebec uh, provinces. And so many wonderful people and so many wonderful missionaries. And, and uh, we still meet with our missionaries every year. and. Uh, it's, it's glorious, and that was one of the highlights, I think, of our lives was to uh, associate and to be called on uh, that mission to uh, Canada. You've accompanied Dad on so many varied assignments. Would you share something about those blessings that you have received? I think one of the most interesting experiences uh, that we had that I can remember uh, was um, going to Germany. Uh, after the wall went down, I remember seeing that <clears throat> on television, which <clears throat> most of you probably did, as they were tearing down the wall. And, and I mentioned to my husband, I said, oh, I would love to be there to see them, you know, be there with them when they're tearing down the wall. Because my husband had uh, worked with the uh, East German saints for many, many years, I think 20 years he had. And uh, he knew so many of them and he loved them and it was a, 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 a wonderful opportunity of his, if his life was speaking with those German people. And uh, he awakened one night, he had heard that they were having, now that the ball was down, that the church was having a big area conference of, of uh, Germans from East Germany and West Germany and he said, I've got to go to that meeting. I've got to go to that meeting. I said, you can't go to that meeting. I said, President Benson is in critical condition in the hospital. There's no way you can leave. He said, I just have to go. And the next morning, uh, President Hinckley talked to him and he said, I think we ought to go up to the hospital and give President uh, Benson a, a blessing. And so they did. And. Uh, he wasn't expected to live. His family had all been called. They were all around and uh, because they expected him uh, to pass away right away. And uh, so they gave him that blessing, President Hinckley and my husband, and, and promised him that he would live and get better. And everyone was amazed. His family was amazed. They said, we can't believe it that you would do that. And. Uh, <laughs> But you know, the next, next day, they moved him out of intensive care into a private room. A couple of days later, they moved him home to his apartment with nursing care, of course. And you know, he lived two or three years longer after that, uh, that blessing. And we went to that meeting in Germany, and it was the most spiritual and fantastic meeting I've ever attended to see families reunited again after 40 years of being uh, separated. And it was, it was just something you can never ever realize the, the inspiration that came from that meeting and, and to be with those people. And so I certainly think the Lord, the Lord blessed us. He blessed President uh, Benson and, and uh, all of those wonderful people. And, and that was one of the uh, most wonderful experiences I have, I have had, and uh, I love that very much in traveling with him. I'd like to bear my testimony and tell you that I know that this church is true. 
I've been blessed. I think I've been brought back to life literally a couple of times because of blessings and the Lord's inspiration and in helping me. I uh, love my association with these sisters, with all the general authorities and their wives, and meeting with people throughout the world. They are wonderful. As Sister Hinckley mentioned to us today, her ex experience in Chile this last week where they had, I think, 55,000 people come out uh, to hear them, and uh, how they all waved white handkerchiefs to them as they said farewell. And you know, these people are all over the world, and it's, uh, it does us so much good and gives us so much love for these people. I'm grateful for my, as I said, for my daughter here. She just, she's been the light of my life, and uh, like I say, more than a daughter, but a very, very dear friend and her sweet family. And just last week we were here, our granddaughter graduated. And uh, that was a wonderful experience, and we're grateful for her wonderful children. And, and uh, I say these things in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, Mother, if, if we talk really slowly, we'll only have to go through half these cards. So. <laughs> um, why don't you just begin, Mother? It's on your cards. Why don't you just do what's on your cards? I don't have an, a beginning here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, then just, then just do the... <laughs> just well, do whatever's here. That's the way it goes with us. Nothing ever works out. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I'm just absolutely overwhelmed with the number of people here. Don't you folks have anything to do? <laughs> Well, I do want to thank you for being here. <laughs> Otherwise, all this work I've done would be for naught. <laughs> thank you for being here <laughs> and bringing such a wonderful feeling of really true friendship with you. Okay, this is this me. You. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't rehearse this, as you can see. <laughs> Today we thought we would just share with you just two or three little things that um, have been helpful to me as, as a daughter and, and ways in which Mother has, I think, blessed all of our lives. Uh, mother has been a great source of wisdom and strength to me, as I think most mothers are to daughters. As her oldest child, I have watched her mother. and. I anticipated with her the birth of all of the rest of the children in the family. It always appeared to me that mothering was so easy. <laughs> Mother made it seem like it was so much fun. <laughs> and I uh, had no clue until I became a mother what a challenging job mothering was. In the years of my own mothering, I would often turn to mother as a source of strength and wisdom. She was as practical as Dr. Spock and a lot more accessible. I remember early in the years of my own mothering saying to her one day, Mother, why didn't you tell me being a mother was so hard? And she said, I did. You just didn't hear it or understand it. <laughs> I think I didn't hear it or understand it because she always made it seem so wonderful. Is that me? It's you. <laughs> <laughs> Make it sound wonderful, Mother. <laughs> I think I better go home. <laughs> <laughs> Mothering really is hard. <laughs> Even at this age. <laughs> but it doesn't mean you can't love it. <laughs> Those years of being a mother to young children were wonderful years. We lived in a semi, 
rural area. We had a large piece of property with lawns and gardens and orchards and plenty of work to keep the children out of mischief. Just didn't work. <laughs> Did I go home? <laughs> Especially wonderful were the summers when the children were young and home where I could be the boss. <laughs> I did my best to keep those summers unstructured when they were young so that they'd have time to explore and lie on their backs and listen to the birds. They built tree houses and ran through the fields. They spent their summer nights playing run, sheepy, run and kick the can. And when fall came and school began, I sent them off to school with a twinge of sadness. I didn't really shed tears, but. <laughs> <laughs> she told us she did. <laughs> I hope that all of you find joy in your children. If not, you're in trouble. <laughs> we, may, we may not be able to provide everything for them. We may not be able to take them on exotic vacations. That doesn't matter. Is, am I speaking into this? Yeah, you're supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Okay. You may not be able to take them on ex Oh, I said that. <laughs> but. It does. When it's, <laughs> it's good I brought her. Oh. Mother, we've got to get serious here. I can't. I don't know how. When it's cloudy and wet. When it's cloudy and wet, read a book together. Have you ever done that? That's a good idea. Or even better. Make something good to eat. <laughs> Give them time to explore and learn about the feel of grass and the wiggliness of worms. It's wonderful. <laughs> One summer day, our oldest boy, I think he's here today, so I better be careful about what I say. <laughs> he turned up missing. There was work to be done, and as the hours take ticked away. I practiced the speech I would give him when he came home at mealtime, which I knew he would. <laughs> Finally, when he came, I said, where have you been? And he said, down in the hollow. And what have you been doing down in the hollow? I said, nothing. He replied, for some reason, I did not pursue the conversation. I didn't. <laughs> Years later, I had reason to be glad. He was home from his mission and a senior at the university. It was test week. He was under a lot of pressure in order to get into the graduate school of his choice. Things were not going very well with his girlfriend, and that was very bad. The pressures of adult life were beginning to be felt. I watched him as he drove home from school one afternoon. He got out of the car and kicked a clot of dirt, went over to examine the swelling buds on the lilac tree. He came in the kitchen straddled a chair backwards and said, Mom, I had a wonderful childhood, didn't I? And I thought, I'm glad he enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said to him, I hope you did have a wonderful childhood. You did complain a lot about all the work you had to do. Oh, it was wonderful, he said. Those long summer days 
when you could lie on your back in the hollow and listen to the birds sing and watch the ants build their castles. I always wondered what he was doing out there. <laughs> the memory of a piece of a summer's day sustained him when the pressures of adult life began to crowd in. Mother, I remember when my own children became teenagers and their emotions were all over the charts. <laughs> and I, I realized that I could only be as happy as my saddest child. And one day it came to me that for the rest of my life I would be sad. <laughs> because someone would always be down. And with your classic sage wisdom, you said, this is true. But at the same time, you must not forget that the greatest joys you will ever know will come from your family. And those two will be endless. Jewish women have a wonderful way of bidding each other goodbye. They say, they don't say goodbye, they don't say adios, they say, have joy in your children. And so I would say to all of you, have joy in your mothering. I know it's hard, but try. <laughs> Whether you are the mother, the aunt, the aunt, <laughs> I was trying, She's to, trying be fancy. to be <laughs> Where were we? <laughs> whether you're the aunt. Oh. And the grandmother. The grandmother. Whether, whether you're the aunt, the grandmother, or the next door neighbor. How marvelous are the women who are nurturing and strengthening the youth of today. Okay, Mother, I think uh, the two o'clock bell is going to ring here any minute. Um, Good. <laughs> we'll do one more little segment here. Uh, <laughs> Mother's faith has always been simple and practical. It is a pure kind of faith, uncluttered by philosophical views. Her faith has always sustained her and us. That faith was born in, a home, in the home of her parents and has been refined through her own experiences. Keep going, that's good. <laughs> no, you read it. <laughs> I did grow up in a family of faith. My mother and father were people of great faith. They practiced that faith, and they took opportunities to share it with us. Each 24th of July, during my growing up years, my father would take all of, the, all of us children up to the little mountain in Emigration Canyon, to the place where the pioneers came over the hill into the Salt Lake Valley. We would sit on the rocks while he told us the story of his mother. Mary Goble, and the suffering she experienced as part of that ill-fated Martin Handcart Company, which was caught in the early winter storms as they made their way to join the saints in Zion. Her feet were frozen, and her toes were removed with a butcher knife and a saw. Father did not moralize, or he did not, and he did not lecture. But the love and appreciation he had for his mother's faith were transferred to our impressionable hearts. Mother's practical faith pulled us through a number of crises. One summer when we were young children, we rented a small cabin in Brighton. Mother took the children to Brighton and we left Dad home because he had a pressing deadline on a piece of writing that he was doing. We thought it was wonderful to just go with mother and have th these few days. One morning we packed a lunch and we hiked up to Twin Lakes and we, we got about three quarters of the way around the lake 
when the trail suddenly came out of the woods and came right to the water's edge where it dropped off a little precipice right into this deep water. Now mother, whose fear of water <laughs> causes her to be borderline aquaphobic, <laughs> took one look at that water and panicked. She knew that one by one we would fall off the edge into the deep water and she would never see us again. <laughs> but short of turning around, there was no other way to go except down that little cliff toward the water. <clears throat> As we stood pondering this situation, she gathered us together. We knelt in the dirt around a log while mother offered a prayer with a particular plea that we could get through this impasse without falling into the water. With that renewal of faith, Mother then helped us negotiate the precipice, and we lived to tell about it. Well, I've always felt that if you believe in something, you better practice it. And I have seen that happen in the lives of members of this church all over the world. Faith brings miracles. And those miracles are occurring in this church every day. I well remember back in 1960 when the work was started in the Philippines. My husband and I took four young elders from the Hong Kong area down into the Philippines to open the work. In my eyes, they were just boys, 19 and 20 years old. They were simple and unlearned in the ways of the world. I had a son at home that was just turning 19, and so I knew how simple and unlearned they were. <laughs> the thought of those three boys, four boys, being given the responsibility of establishing the kingdom of God in the Philippine Islands absolutely overwhelmed me. As we left the country, I looked back at them and I said to my husband with tears in my eyes, how can you do this? How can you leave those four boys here alone? They're not alone, he said. The Lord is with him. He was right. The Lord was with him. Over the years, we've watched the work grow in that part of the world. In 1996, we went to Manila and met with a crowd of 34,000 saints who had come from all parts of the Philippine Islands. Do I go on here? <laughs> Why don't we just skip this because we're out of time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, it's you. Then it, <laughs> they just want to hear Excuse this. Excuse us. <laughs> I do this? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I remember years ago attending a meeting with the servicemen and their families in Vietnam. In attendance were two Vietnamese girls. One of these beautiful young women stood and bore her testimony. She said, and I quote, One thing is great surprise. My family is hardly ever sick since coming into the church. Maybe this is one of the blessings that the Lord has given me because my family has always been so much sick. And now I pray, Father, give my family good health and they are sick no more. I always try to be righteous and fair, she said, but now I have faith. Mother. Uh, over the years, your advice and influence has shaped my life. What message would you like to share with these women today? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this woman is out of control. <laughs> don't worry, I've got it written here. My advice is to be the best person you can be. Profound, isn't it? You remember in the story of Esther when Mordecai asked Esther, Esther to go to the king in an effort to save her Jewish people from destruction. 
She knew that the punishment for appearing before the king without an invitation was death. Mordecai responded to her by saying, Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for just such a time as this? That message, I think, applies to each of us. Women today find themselves in very different circumstances. We may ask, is life fair? Was this what I was born to do? We ask that all the time, don't we, Mother? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Perhaps our greatest quest is to live worthy to know what the Lord's will is concerning us, what we are meant to do. Some of us are married, some of us are not, and fortunately, fortunately, I mean, What's the matter? Where are we now? Um, some, of just oh. some women are leaders. That's a profound statement. This church is full of them. Bright, capable women who are doing wonderful things. During World War II. During World War II. Oh, he made me skip some. <laughs> <laughs> During World War II, we were encouraged to plant gardens, not only by the church, but by the government. My husband dug 3,000 holes in the property next to our house, and he planted 3,000 tomato plants. <laughs> you can just guess what that did to me. He hoed them all right, and he weeded them, and he irrigated them at 4.30 every Monday morning. But when the tomatoes were ripe, I spent my days picking them. <laughs> Baskets full, boxes full. We put up a sign, tomatoes for sale. Toward the end of the crop, we couldn't give them away. <laughs> my back ached. And I could have said at that time, is this what I was born to do? <laughs> but the tomatoes went on people's food shelves, and the money we, paid for, we were paid for them paid the taxes on our home that year and gave us shelter for our children. Our efforts had made a difference. Now, can I have another minute? Please, take all the time you want. <laughs> well, I'm glad. <laughs> because I wanted to tell you about Nellie. Nellie was my grandmother's, my grandfather's sister. She never married. And she kind of thought that her wife, life was a waste because she had no posterity. She was a nurse. And when mother's babies were born, she would come up from Mer her home in American Fork and she'd move in with us for a week or two. And she'd take care of mother and the baby. When my mother was 91 and was floating in and out of consciousness during her last illness, she kept saying, oh, if only Nellie were here, she could make me comfortable. I've thought about that a great deal. We all have our place. We all have our own unique opportunity to make someone happy and comfortable. The gospel calls us to stretch ourselves, to embrace our talents, to concentrate on our strengths, to be productive, and to reach our full potential. Let us not waste our time in bitterness saying, is this what I was born to do? <laughs> but rather, as Esther was asked, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? We are all in this together, and oh, how we need each other. Those of us who are old, we really need you who are young. And hopefully you are who are young need us who are old. 
We need to renew our faith every day. We need to lock arms and build this kingdom together. Be thankful and be glad. The Lord loves you and he will bless you. In closing, may I just express our appreciation as a family to the, to the Fouse and the Monsons who are so supportive and who are so helpful to mother and dad. They are such a blessing in our lives, how we love and appreciate them. And how I love mother, you, you can tell. <laughs> we have a very a wonderful and fun relationship. And uh, we so appreciate what she has done for us in our lives as our, as our matriarchal leader and as our example. Thank you, mother. Keep going. I'll keep going. <laughs>